Hey everyone, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about stock market and the economy amongst other things. So today I'm coming to you live from a phone booth inside of a WeWork in New York City. Last week I was in a little office, but today I'm in a phone booth. And this is going to be a really interesting one for me today. Very briefly, before I get into the entire piece, I just want to give my bear case for WeWork. The doors in here, they're loud as heck in here. This is an unstable business model. Yep, I have my major, major beef with the Wii. I got major beef with the Wii's. So this is a really fun uh, piece for me. This is Volmageddon and the Rise of Passive. This is in partnership with Simplify ETFs. And I'll talk a little bit about what they do and all the different things that they have enabled later on in, in this video. There's a written version as well if you're interested in checking that out. I highly, highly recommend it. So getting right into it, I own a target date mutual fund in my 401k. When I first started my first job, that's what they entrusted me. They said, just pick the date that's nearest to when you plan to retire. And I was like, oh, I didn't know retirement was going to be an option for me. What an exciting development in my life. I, I picked the 2060 mutual fund and I've stuck with it ever since. But there's a really interesting relationship between people like me who have these mutual funds and these target date funds and the larger market macro structure. That's a tongue twister. So there's a big question, right? So what happens when passive flows interrupt the market? What happens when we have a lot of passive money flying into the market? And what does that mean how we think about valuations and fundamentals? And the big question is, do those even matter anymore? We're getting into the idea of correlation and volatility. In 2017, the market was essentially just flat. There were basically 25 basis points moves every day, and that was like a big day. The market wasn't really responding to anything, which led to a pretty depressed level of volatility, which makes sense because volatility is a function of a variation in prices. So if the market is hardly moving, it makes sense that a variation in prices wouldn't be happening, right? If the market's not moving, you're not going to get a whole lot of variation. When the market is depressed like this, it becomes more correlated. So it just kind of ticks upward. If you have nothing happening at the surface level, it's going to just everything's going to tend to move together because there's just not a lot going on. And this is a function of passive flows and volatility selling, which I'll touch on a little bit later, but you can kind of think of this big combo piece as a flat market, depressed volatility, and increased correlation. If the market does begin to move, which it does eventually, usually responding to exogenous shocks, volatility begins to move and we see correlations begin to rise. So a zero to 25 basis point move correlations are going to be really, really flat. 25 to 50 basis points move, correlations begin to rise. 50 to 100 basis point move, correlations begin to spike. So zooming out here, the market is more correlated than it's ever been, but this is primarily because the market barely budges. When the markets do move, aka move up by this more than 50 basis points move, they're going to show a higher correlation, and with higher correlation comes higher levels of implied volatility. The kinetic energy of that volatility is, is there, right? Like it's definitely underneath the surface. And the big question is, why don't the markets move? Why don't we see a lot of outsized movement? And a lot of this is because systematic volatility selling. A lot of people are scraping for yield in the current market environment. They're like, okay, we're going to do anything for a few extra basis points of return. And everyone wants to enhance their yields. And one way to do that is by going short volatility, aka you think that volatility is going to remain flat or depressed. And so, for example, you buy a call. The dealer on the other side of your trade, because there always has to be somebody who wants to sell if you want to buy, they say, okay, we're going to short the S&P in order to delta hedge this trade. We're just going to protect the, for, the, for the market to go down. And so your call is a bullish trade and the dealer shorts the S&P, which is a bearish trade. So essentially delta neutral, right? So just flattening everything out. And so then the big question is what happens if the markets move? If the market goes up, your call is going to gain delta. So the dealer is going to need to short more of the market in order to balance that out. They say, okay, everything's moving up too fast. We got to short it on the other side, really balance that out. And the market goes down because the dealer is moving. If the market goes down by itself, right, same thing, but opposite. The dealer needs to buy back its shorts and that pushes the market up. So the market exists in this in-between world, a pull balancing. So if the market's going up, the dealer's like, uh-uh. If the market's going down, the dealer's like, uh-uh. So either way, you have the dealer delta hedging and that ends up with this pull essentially balancing on this stick. And now more than ever, it really 
operates in this very small realm of possibility. Algorithms have made this pull balance even better. The band of movement has gotten even tighter, the market moving one way and then structurally moving the other. And the overall market has shifted to being even more precise and even more compressed. As long as nothing spooks the algorithms, they should stay within this tight band of movement. But exogenous shocks do happen, COVID most recently and Volmageddon most notably. In terms of Volmageddon, XIV died in February 2018. And this is a really brief, like non-technical overview of what happened here. Um, I'll link to some resources where you can go and read a little bit more. XIV was a $2 billion entity and that collapsed within itself. It was an exchange traded note, not an exchange traded fund. And its movement was linked to the inverse of futures representing the VIX. So every time that the VIX would go up, this thing would go down. And most specifically, it wasn't the VIX itself, but a product named VXX. But more specifically, this is what the paper said. The Velocity Shares Daily Inverse VIX short-term ETN provides negative 1x leverage exposure to an index compromising first and second month VIX future positions with a weighted average maturity of one month. The VIX goes up, volatility increases, XIV falls. The market was slowly ticking upwards during this time. It didn't seem like there was going to be an exogenous shock. It didn't really seem like there'd be anything that's going to make the VIX spike and XIV go down, right? But slowly, the beta of the VIX to the S&P began to rise. Normally, this is somewhere between 4 and 8, so relatively low. But in the weeks before Volmageddon, it was around 22. And this means that the VIX was very, very sensitive to any sort of movement in the S&P. At a very high level, because XIV was 100% inverse to the VIX, if the VIX doubled at any point, XIV would go to zero. Which isn't great, right? So if you had VIX doubling going from 10 to 20, XIV would go down to zero. And on February 2nd, 2018, the Fed changed reserve requirements at the banks. The before case was if you owned equities as a bank, you had to hold capital against a 30% one day decline. The equivalent risk exposure for a short vol position was a 10 point jump in the VIX. But the thing is, a 30% decline in the S&P is not a 10 point jump in the VIX. It's roughly a jump in the VIX to 240. With the VIX 13 in the days before vol Magellan, even a move 226, much less than 40 or 50, would cause XIV to crash all the way down to zero. So all the VIX had to do was go up to 26, which is what happened. VIX spiked to 50 on February 6th. And with all the banks expressing their equity positions, a short vol, like, oh no, we don't think vol's going to go up. That's not good. The short vol position was very, very crowded. The Fed ended up changing risk exposure from 10 points to 30 points, freaked a lot of people out in terms of the VIX. Everyone was trying to cover, everyone was trying to get insurance, and it's estimated that there was $1 trillion of exposure via short vol positioning. So there was an exogenous shock in the system and that resulted in the implosion of XIV. Market got spooked, volatility spiked, XIV got speared. But the big question is, how could something like this XIV exist and impact the market this much. And so the underlying theory here is that passive flows end up changing the behavior of the market. Think about a river running over a stone. Over time, that river is going to change the shape of the stone. With passive flows, Vanguard, BlackRock, etc. all invest passively with most of their funds, meaning that they invest just to mimic the performance of certain funds like the S&P 500, which is really fine. Why wouldn't you want to mimic the performance of the S&P 500? On the other side of that, though, Active managers try to actively beat the benchmark that they're working with, whereas passive are like, all we have to do is like literally match this, like, whatever. And that's fine too. What's the big deal? The issue here is with the stone changing shape. So this passive flows will keep on running even when market fundamentals are like, whoa, maybe this river should slow down. Vanguard doesn't care if the market is all time highs, they're going to continue buying. Whereas active managers are a little bit more discerning in how they purchase and when they purchase. Vanguard essentially purchases every single stock and they're like, oh, wow, you know, the market's extremely overvalued. We still have to buy this right now. And they literally do because of fund mandates. And these flows end up pushing the market up more than anything else. So you can kind of think about it this way. Imagine that an active manager goes to the supermarket. They're going to use coupons. They're going to price match. They're going to be that person in line that has like a coupon book and they're pricing everything out. Me, essentially. Passive managers that go to the store and buy things at 2x the price. So think of people who go to Erewhon. Great supermarket, but everything's mad expensive there. And for what? So you have a bunch of people that are paying 2x the price. The market is going to normalize towards that price. The line to Erewhon is essentially out the door. This gets into the idea of demographics and market efficiency. Most people myself have our money in 401ks and they're set up with target date funds. And this shows up in the numbers. So people under the age of 40 are 90% passive, whereas 
people over 65 are more like 20% passive. So that's a huge, huge discrepancy. And this dichotomy is really important because boomers, as they retire, they're going to take their actively managed, so their 80% actively managed dollars out of the market, which ends up skewing exposure towards passive. As Gen Z ages, as the younger generation gets more jobs, they get more 401k money, they're going to invest more passively. They're already 90% passive. That's going to skew exposure towards passive even more. And this kind of ends up being this perfect demographic storm. So boomers are retiring, Gen Z is aging, the passive flows continue. The shift to passive results in the S&P 500 increasingly behaving like this single stock. All the stocks are correlated and moving together. And if passive flows go into air one and are paying 2x the price, everybody ends up paying the 2x the price. All those prices are going to move to a similar function to each other, which is essentially going up. And right now, passive market share is only about 44% of the market, but the correlation is going to continue to increase as demographics change, etc., as relationships change. And the idea for a long time was that the market was efficient, will be efficient, until it's like to 80-90% passive. That's what John Bowell, the founder of Vanguard himself, said. The theory now is that we're much more closer to a loss of efficiency if the market gets like 50 to 60% passive. So we're already at 44%. And the idea was that we'd be safe until 80 to 90%, that the river would keep on running over stone, but not a big deal. But the market's going to get up inefficient once we reach this 50 to 60 percent space and because everyone starts playing in the same sandbox with the same tools there's only so much time before things end up looking the same people are buying the same stuff buying as it goes up and then the stocks start trading like each other and this leads to a few key things price suppression the passive flows are going to pay any price they are not price discriminatory vanguard is going to pay any price for tesla and they're going to have tesla in their funds also higher volatility so if the market behaves like a single stock that's going to drive volatility and push correlation think of diversification if you're 100 percent exposed to tesla you're exposed to the fluctuations of Tesla across the board. Ideally, you would diversify by investing in different stocks. But if the entire stock market is trading like one big entity, you're not going to be able to diversify. Then the last concept is inelasticity. So think of insulin. You have to buy insulin if you have diabetes. It's an inelastic good. You have to have insulin in order to manage it. It's the same with the markets here. There's an element of inelasticity where passive managers have to purchase things at any price. Their supply and demand, it's always that same relationship. Historically, there's been a model of mean reversion in the markets. When valuations are high, people are like, I'm not going to, I'm going to sell, I'm going to, you know, take my profits and I'm leave. If valuations are really low, people are going to buy and they're going to be wet, less willing to sell. But this is really no longer the case because the marginal investor doesn't pay any attention to valuation. There's just money flowing into passive, which puts upward pressure on valuations, which is fine as long as the market goes up. But what if the market falls? Well, what happens when people freak out in the feedback loop, like freaks out too. What happens when people pull out a Vanguard and Vanguard can't cover that position? The market creators. I think the big thing is, I mean, Kylo, like things should be calm, like passive flows are going to smooth the stone. Things should be smooth because of a lack of liquidity. So passive holders don't react to anything. When people start pulling out of the market, that's a pretty big deal to them. Vanguard just sits there and the active ma managers trade amongst themselves in this sort of reduced liquidity environment because passive is like, oh, well, we're just going to keep on buying. So you don't have that same sort of price discretionary stuff. This creates a mean expansionary environment because now it, Instead of active players setting the price through valuation models and with thought towards return, it just becomes passive players gobbling everything up. Because of that, everything trades as one single entity. Markets just absorb those passive flows and valuations get pushed upwards by passive flows and this circles back to the demographic shift. So it's like really this giant feedback loop where valuations are getting pushed up by flows. And as demographics change, that gets pushed up by flows too. Vanguard estimates that by 2023, 80% of all 401k accounts will have a single product in them, a target date fund. That seems super harmless to have this structure match the S&P, like not a big deal at all, but it's a big issue because now the flows have no taste or no preference. So think of it like this, you know, if a restaurant on Yelp is rated five stars it's really good like it's a really good restaurant but if somebody goes and shakes salt all over the food at every single restaurant it's gonna be like well all this food tastes the same it's all salty it's all bad and so every single restaurant being rated three stars is gonna be really hard to decide what restaurant to go to whereas if everybody was more price discerning and they rated things five stars rather than shaking salt all over everything to make it taste the same you're going to want to go to the five star restaurant passive managers shake salt all over the food and say that everything is three stars versus active managers who tend to operate more in that 
that five star category. So with passive flows that can result in a misshapen market structure. So when you think of portfolio construction theory, the goal is to have expected return, which is a function of historical return and some volatility. But passive flows have disrupted that model, shifting dollars in the market towards people with staying power, those passive investors. Prices have to respond to those that stay, which creates a liquidity crunch for those who want to sell and pushes prices up. You might be like, whoa, this sounds like a market that doesn't trade on fundamentals. And you could be right, because right now there's beta flows, meaning that flows are driving a lot of the market. Think of Kathy Wood and ARC. Price is becoming a function of flows. And flows can prop up the market to a certain extent, but it'd be really bad if people pulled their money out of the market a la March 2020. All of a sudden, the flows aren't there. Flows should not be driving market fundamentals to a certain extent. The overall market structure changed. So back in the 1970s, Fidelity had 2% of the market, and that was the largest share that anybody had. But now BlackRock, Vanguard, Straight Street, Fidelity, etc. all have 7 to 9% of the market, meaning that roughly four firms own 40 to 50% of the market with their passive flows. And you can think of them more like Black Van State Delity because they all move passively. So about 50% of the market and 80% of the flows are going to be moving relatively the same at all time into all the same companies. That puts pressure on the efficient market hypothesis because flows aren't information on prices and valuations at this level. They are to a certain extent, but rather than reverting to the mean, the market is now in this mean explosion dynamic, continuing to shoot upwards and become separated from any sort of valuation relationship entirely. Does Bitcoin fix this? We might as well ask it. HODL, no. The HODL sentiment is really similar. It is passively holding Bitcoin no matter what. And that same sort of inelasticity that shows up in the markets with whales driving most of the inflows, institutions have gotten FOMO and now are moving their flows towards Bitcoin. You can see with the Bitcoin ETFs. We have operated under the assumption that prices move because of information. And of course they move because of transactions too. But now there's 500 billion that went into the market this year with roughly 67% of that going towards black rock and vanguard passive flows are going to get even more exacerbated vanguard is always going to be buying they have a trillion dollar fund so they almost have to be buying they own almost every single stock all the way up to this austrian century bond which is incredibly unattractive but they still own it this is a wind tunnel of money and it's very risky and it's important to hedge against which is why you have companies like simplify etfs so they have different strategies that protect against catastrophic events hedge against events like volmageddon the strategy is designed to provide an attractive income stream and a source of diversification without the risks inherent in high yield bonds through short vix positioning coupled with options to mitigate against potentially adverse moves in the vix simplify was founded in 2020 to help advisors tackle the most pressing portfolio challenges with an innovative set of options-based strategies. By accounting for real-world investor needs and market behavior along with non-linear power of options, their strategies allow for tailored portfolio outcomes that their clients are looking for. Final thoughts here, passive flows are having an impact on how the market is structured, and it's shifting market dynamics to an element of stonks always go up. It's important to understand underlying market mechanics and how that ultimately impacts the entire functioning of the market. Volmageddon was a really great example of a product that ended up driving the market. Passive flows are driving the market more and more, which could be very painful if we have another exogenous shock like Volmageddon. There are strategies that you can implement to protect against the downside, but it's important to understand why the downside needs to be protected and how the plumbing of the systems have changed and how that could impact returns moving forward.